So for this last segment, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for this segment. As uh, we will have an interview between Dr. Gavin Simanovich as well as Stephen Key. Dr. Gavin Simanovich is the director of the Institute of Inventors and Innovators. The Triple I, or the Institute, is a nonprofit set up to help inventors succeed in their invention journey from someone with just an idea to the inventor with an invention that's ready to go to market. He will be interviewing Stephen Key, who is a world's leading expert on how to license a product idea and a 2018 to 2019 AAAS Lemelson Invention Ambassador. As an independent inventor, he achieved repeat success commercializing products ranging from simple novelty gifts to complex packaging innovations. Stephen is currently the patent strategist for Fishbone Packaging, the environmentally friendly solution for single-use plastic rings. In 1999, he co-founded InventRight, the coaching program that has taught inventors from more than 65 countries how to harness the power of open innovation and the licensing business model to bring their ideas to market. Stephen is the author of One Simple Idea, Sell Your Ideas With or Without a Patent, become a professional inventor and licensing ideas using LinkedIn. That's interesting. To help creative people become profitable inventors, Stephen has written more than 1,000 articles for Forbes Inc. and Entrepreneur Magazines and published over 900 videos on his popular YouTube channel, Invent Right TV. As they come to the front, a round of applause, please, for Dr. Gavin Manovich and Stephen Keyes. Thank you, Lita, um, and uh, welcome, Stephen. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, you've already had, welcome to Johannesburg, first of all. I know you've already had some pretty hair-raising experiences as part of your travels. Uh, I'm not talking about walking down the streets of Sandton, even though that can be pretty terrifying, especially when there's load shedding. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've been crawling through holes in serpentine caves. You've been hot air ballooning. You've had a close encounter with a lion, even. Uh, I'm hoping today's interview will be a lot less scary than that. Well, thank you very much. I've had a great time, and and with my wife, we're celebrating 34 years of marriage, and I'm just so happy to be here. Thanks, thank you. And Janice is in the back. Um, yes, thank you very much. Great. So, Stephen, it's a real honor for me to interview you today. Um, you're one of the real legends in the space. Uh, it's a bit surreal, actually. I'm so used to seeing you on YouTube. I'm seeing you on uh, the webinars where you giving you across your messages. Um, and it's um, really a treat to be able to talk to you live in person today. So well, thank, thank you. you very much for that. Thank you. So um, can we go into the next slide, please? Um, so just for the benefit of those of you who uh, don't are not that familiar with your work as I am, uh, can we just kind of set the context a little bit to sort of say, well, what are some of your inventions and, and uh, uh, how did you get started in this whole thing? Well, first of all, I was, <laughs> that's a great question. I was studying economics at Santa Clara University, and I realized that um, the, the business wasn't really something I wanted to do. So I took an art class by mistake and found that I really enjoyed working with my hands. So I went home and told my dad I want to be an artist, and he, he looked at me kind of funny, and he said, go ahead, take that leap. And I did, and I just started creating things. And I realized very shortly that there was something very magical in that process of creating something with your hands. So I've been doing that basically for quite a few years now. So what? What invent? You're a very successful inventor in your own right. What? Uh, what are the inventions that you've actually uh, brought to market? Well, for, first of all, I was at the startup company called Worlds of Wonder, where we launched a talking teddy bear, um, Teddy Rex spin, and laser tag, and that's where I learned about product licensing. And that business model was fascinating to me because, like I said, I didn't like business. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about product licensing in just a minute. But what I do and what I've done for about 40 years is that I come up with ideas and I show those ideas to companies. And if they like those ideas, they take those ideas to market for me and they pay me a royalty in each and every one they sell. So when someone asks me, what are, what's my favorite? They're all my favorite. Some of my ideas are a little bit more profitable than others, but I love them all. And I've done everything from novelty gifts to packaging to just about uh, different industries, yes. 
Um, and then, of course, now you've moved in a slightly different direction. You now uh, coach other inventors in how to bring their uh, inventions to market. You uh, co-founded a company called InventRight with your partner, Andrew Krauss. Uh, what made you move in, in that direction? Well, first of all, I'm still inventing. Uh, I'm still involved in a, a packaging uh, concept. Please go to fishbone.com. You'll see it's a brand new package that eliminates the plastic on beverages, those plastic rings. And we've licensed that to a company called Fish uh, Atlantic Packaging, and it's rolling out um, across the United States now. I just started talking about this process of product uh, licensing to a group uh, like the III, and I talked uh, a little bit about my process, and I found a way that was very simple for someone like me that didn't like the business aspect of how can you bring that idea to market without maybe raising money, without hiring people. And I met my partner, Andrew Krauss, at one of those events, and I started sharing my process with other inventors because they were struggling too. And maybe they didn't have the, the resources to start a company, or maybe they didn't even have the desire. So I started talking about it. I started sharing my process, and I realized that a lot of people just were not familiar with product licensing, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. And of course, uh, InventRight has got a huge amount of free content that's available. Uh, I encourage all of you to go have a look. Uh, you've got a webinar that happens yeah. once, uh, once a month. I know Celeste and our regulars happens at 2 o'clock in the morning, South African time. Uh, yeah. But it's worth it. The content is that good that it's really worth it. Um, we are, we made a uh, – Andrew Cross, my partner, and I, we, you know, 20, 20 years ago, we had the same philosophy. We thought we were going to give everything away. We thought this information was so important that – we just wanted to share it with everybody. So we've written quite a few articles over the years, I think a thousand articles, one million words, 900 videos, five books. And we're still talking about it even here. I think the message is really important. If, if you're creative, you need to have a way to share your creativity with the world. And that's what I've been doing for about two decades. Right. And of course you've written four books as well. Um, and uh, just for the audience, we are giving away free copies of, of the books uh, right at the end of the session. Uh, later this afternoon, so uh, please stick around for that. But um, let's um, let's get straight into the topic now. So uh, mm -hmm. InventRight uh, is all about the licensing model and so-called open innovation. Now, these are not terms that are very well recognized in South Africa. Um, what exactly is open innovation and licensing, just to set the scene? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm not sure everyone's familiar with that term, open innovation, but basically companies have realized in order to stay competitive, they need ideas, and they need ideas from anyone. So a company that has embraced the term open innovation have opened their doors to work with people like, like all of us, people that have ideas, and people that are creative. They have realized that maybe I have a team of designers in the back and they're working really hard for, for the company, but what if I open the doors and thousands of ideas could come through that portal or through that door? that the chances of them finding a great idea just increased. And they love the business model because they only pay a royalty for an idea that they take. So it's a wonderful business model for companies. And we've realized that this open innovation business model has been around for a long time. It's not exactly new, but more and more companies around the world are looking for ideas from each and every one of you. Fascinating. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in more detail, but just let's set the context. So um, you teach a 10-step process, uh, part of the invent process from when you initially have the idea until you actually uh, finally commercialize it through a licensing agreement. Um, later this afternoon, we're going to talk in more detail about those 10 steps. Uh, in today's limited time that we have in this session now, we're really going to only focus on step one or step seven rather, one step of of the 10 steps, and that's around protecting your idea. Um, just to kind of set the context, though, could you briefly just talk about the 10 step process and what that entails okay. uh, in terms of the innovation, the invention journey? Yeah, we put together a, a 10 step program that just about anybody can do. And like I said, we've had students in over 65 different countries apply these 10 steps in all different types of products. It's 
It starts with the very first step that anybody can do anywhere, and that's really looking at the marketplace. It's called study the marketplace to see if you have a real, if you really have a new idea. And you can do that by doing a Google image search. And then of course, if you do not find your idea, you would wanna do a, a patent search to make sure it is new. So that's really the foundation of that first step. You wanna make sure you, you are really studying the marketplace. And then we go through the process of, do you really have a good idea? That's evaluating your idea, then maybe creating a 3D computer generated model, maybe a marketing piece. See, we believe that the, the, the easiest way to do this is try to sell the benefit of your idea first. Before you go ahead and spend money, maybe on a prototype, or maybe even do some of the things that you think you need to do. And you can do that, sell, you can sell the benefit with a one page advertisement. So we talk about through our program, how to create that, that one page advertisement, we call it a sell sheet that has the benefit of your idea and shows a picture. Maybe it's a prototype, maybe it's a sketch, but basically it's just an advertisement of why someone would care. Then we go through that process a little bit further to reach out to companies that want to see your ideas. Those are those, those are those open innovation companies. Then we talk about how to reach out to those companies through LinkedIn, because you can get to anybody, anybody now through LinkedIn. It's the greatest tool for any of us anywhere in the world. Now, number seven, I think step number seven is the really important part. How do you protect your creativity? And there's all these tools and we talked about. Everybody talked about it today from trademarks and copyrights and patents and all these wonderful tools. I do believe it's very important that you understand those tools that are available to you to protect your creativity. And those are the tools that most people just don't understand. But once you educate yourself on those tools, you realize you can protect just about any type of creativity. I love the patents. I'm a patent holder. I have over 20 patents in my name. I have defended my patents against a little toy company, Lego, a few years ago in San Francisco Federal Court. So the tools work. They're fantastic tools, but you have to understand how to use them. So number seven, that's very important. Before you start to reach out to companies. So that step, uh, we'll dig really deep into that step a little bit later today. But those 10 steps, and I just went through them fairly quick, not all of them, allows anybody anywhere in the world to break those barriers down. So the thing that I really love about these 10 steps, it doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter your income level, it does not matter if you're retired, it doesn't matter even if you're in high school, if you apply these 10 steps and find those right companies that are looking for ideas, protect it correctly, you can play the biggest game in the world. Thank you. Um, so obviously you went through that 10 step process really quickly. <laughs> you gave me a kind of a five minute interview. Uh, we are going to have a, a four hour version of, of the 10 step process uh, after lunch in the masterclass. So uh, if you haven't looked for that yet, then there's uh, still place for that. So I encourage people in the audience to do that. Uh, that's going to be a real treat. Um, but let's talk about step seven again, protecting okay. your idea. So, um, you know, at, at the II, we deal with inventors all the time. And one of the most common things that we see is inventors getting fiercely protective about the idea. They, they really worry that people are going to steal the idea, that they're going to copy them. Um, almost to the point of paranoia. Um, I remember uh, at one of our events uh, during the break, I was talking to one of the delegates and I was just making some small talk. And I said to him, you know, so, so what have you invented? What are you working on? Um, and he, he kind of, looked me up and down a bit and he said, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. And uh, I don't think he was joking either. I think it was, uh, you know, quite a serious thing. And it's, it's this paranoia is not just, um, you know, encountered with him. It, it's almost every inventor has got some degree of paranoia about people stealing the idea. And it's, um, it can be quite destructive because on the one hand, you need to protect your idea. On the other hand, you need to share your idea with potential licensees with potential investors if you want to make money from that idea. So how do you resolve that paradox? How do you protect your idea, but at the same time share it with people so that you can actually make money out of it? That's a great question. I think a lot of inventors are fearful. And I'm going to kick fear. I'm going to kick that fear to the curb a little bit later this afternoon because it, it it's all in your mind. You see, if you find those companies that are looking for ideas, they need ideas. 
And sometimes they'll even help you protect an idea. And the reason why they don't steal your ideas is that they want to keep the doors open. I'll give you I'll give you a great example of a company. Let's talk about a toy company, Hasbro. They're known around the world. 60% of all their products at Hasbro, Hasbro has came from people like us. And they're looking, they have a portal now called Spark, which are, they're looking for ideas from any anybody in, anywhere in the world. So you want to find those companies that embrace open innovation that want to work with us. That's the first thing to do. And that's your best protection. Now, but what you also want to do is realize what tools do you need to protect your ideas, right? If you have a game, maybe you copyright it. Maybe you have a great name of, of a product, maybe you do a trademark. Or maybe you have something that has some functionality that's just, you're doing something brand new for the first time, so you file for a patent. So just learn those tools. And if you understand those tools correctly, you apply those tools to the right opportunity. But the best thing to do is reach out to those companies that do embrace open innovation, ask about their process, understand what they're looking for, understand how important intellectual property is to them, and build that relationship. That's what's the most important part. Inventors that are fearful, I think they're stealing their ideas from themselves, that eventually those ideas will go nowhere. If you're sitting here today, and if you have an idea, I can guarantee it, if you don't do anything about it, there's a good chance you might see it later on the store shelf and think, why didn't I do anything about it? The traditional business model that's being taught today is that I'm going to venture my idea. I am going to raise money, raise capital. I'm going to build a prototype. I'm going to hire people and I'm going to go down that road. The thing that's so amazing about product licensing today, it's speed. When you find a company that's been in business for how many years, that has the shelf space, that has the manufacturing, the distribution, they have everything in place. What they need is what you have. They need that idea. So they can take that idea and they can bring it to market so fast and that's a form of its own protection. Today, I hate to tell everybody, it's kind of hard to protect things. It's a big world out there. But I tell everybody, look, the, the things that you need to understand, understand the tools, find the right companies, and let that company take that idea and bring it to market lightning fast for you. That's the best protection you can have. Fantastic. I love that. Stealing from yourself. Well, I, I talk a lot about that a little bit later on intellectual yeah. property strategy. I write uh, about that for Forbes on, on how to how to file and how to write intellectual property from a business perspective. Because many times we're looking at it from a legal one, which you should. But if you look at it from a business perspective, not only will you protect um, your invention, you'll protect the innovation. And you will make sure that those claims that you're filing will align up with your business objectives. And you'll look at it in such a way that you're going to overcome arguments you see, if you file intellectual property correctly, especially patents, you're going to be able to overcome arguments that are going to come your way because they're always going to come your way. That first argument, the first one you're going to get is going to be from that, maybe that investor. Why am I investing in you? The number one tool, if you're a startup, is filing first and filing good intellectual property. Those type of startups are raising the money faster the success rate of those successful startups is because of the IP they're filing fast. Now, the other, the other argument, if you're going to license an idea and you file a good intellectual property, they look at it and you've done your homework, you know the prior art, you, 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 you know the manufacturing, you've added that, maybe workarounds and variations, you put this thing together that they're confident to work with you. You're always taking away risk. Whenever you're filing intellectual property, it's just taking away risk for people to join your mission. And then the next obstacle, the argument, is going to be a patent examiner. Why are we going to issue you this intellectual property? But if you look at it this way and you include the manufacturing and workarounds and variations, if you really have done your homework with a good patent attorney, I can guarantee you're going to get a claim. And then the last argument is going to be, right, if someone infringes, and that's going to happen, it's just happened to me. 
But if you if you understand intellectual property, if you work with a, a firm that a law firm that understands it, that's going to has your best interest and and does everything that you need as a partnership, then when something goes wrong, they're your partner to get you out of trouble, because something could go wrong. Occasionally, it does. Right. So you you you're speaking about filing fast. Well, sorry about moving fast. Those are the, the yeah. winners in this game because uh, the world is is getting exponentially quicker. Um, you know, the traditional route of, of filing a patent uh, can often be seen as quite a slow process. What what are some of the other tools, intellectual property tools, that allow the companies to actually move a bit quicker in order to get to that stage, perhaps before they, they go for the full patent well, application? Well, that's a great question. I do believe that you need to help your patent attorney do a good job. Your patent attorney is only as good as the information you provide them. So I'm a big believer that you give them the tools and, and some of those things are, how do you manufacture it? A lot of the applications or patents I see today, there's no manufacturing. If you cannot make something, the, the patent has no value at all. So work with your patent attorney and give them the information for them to do a great job for you. That might include some manufacturing, the material. And if you don't understand how to manufacture, that's okay. Find someone on LinkedIn, have them sign an NDA that includes work for hire language, meaning anything they invent, you still own. Grab that information because those little details are so important. The other part too is the workarounds and variations. If you have an idea, steal it from yourself. Because I know in here we probably have a lot of engineers they are really smart. They're thinking about how to do it differently. Those companies, maybe you submit it to, or maybe someone in the in your space might try to get around you. So steal it from yourself and share that with your patent attorney of all the variations. So when you combine all these things together with a lot of drawings, variations, and manufacturing, those are some wonderful future tools to, to overcome those arguments. Now. What you do have here is a provisional patent application, which is a wonderful tool for inventors. If you're on a budget, file a PPA. You could do it yourself or highly recommend working with a, a patent attorney. If you're a startup, you want to work a little faster, you want to file that patent and bypass that PPA because that gives you value in the marketplace. So you have to look at where you are, what you want to do, and find the right strategy. I do believe if you find your patent attorney and share with them your goal, what do you want to do? Long-term goal, where do, you, where do you want to be? And have them provide you a strategy at the very beginning because this process can be long. It can be expensive. That's the first step in this whole process. Yeah. What about uh, NDAs? So, uh, you know, people, again, inventors uh, who fiercely protective, if they haven't got a patent, then they won't say a word until there's an NDA in place. <clears throat> and obviously there's the other school of thought that yeah. are they really worth the paper that they're written on? What is your view on that? Well, I, I, I think NDAs are a great tool. It's just how do you use them and when do you use them? If you have an idea and you want to show it to a company and you ask them to sign an NDA at the very beginning, they're not going to sign that. Right. So, but if you can sell the benefit first, and then when they ask to see the secret sauce, then have them sign an NDA. It's it's a it's the right sequence. Now realize too, they're not going to sign yours, because if they were to sign all these NDAs, it would get a little hectic. So, you're most likely going to sign theirs. So read it very very thoroughly. And if you don't understand it, that's when you go back to your patent attorney and go, hey, what does this mean? So make sure before you sign anything, you have good advice. But at the end of the day, what I really like about NDAs, because they're, they're not really a protection vehicle, maybe they are if you have a trade secret. Okay, I get it. But what I like about NDAs, they can help you determine your, 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 your public disclosure of an idea. See, they're, they're, they're really used as a different tool. And I'm going to go in great length about those tools to be used with NDAs. But these are just tools, right? And you have to educate yourself how to use the tools. And it's only you. That's the thing I'm trying to stress to everybody. A lot of this work, you have to learn yourself. Because a lot of us want to find someone to do it for us. 
right? And sometimes that doesn't work out so well. So you want to educate yourself, build your team, and have a strategy and make sure uh, whatever you're trying to do, you have the right tools to protect mm -hmm. that strategy. Right. So that, uh, that famous intellectual, Mark Tyson, uh, didn't say many smart things in his life, but he did say one thing that I found quite profound, which is everyone has got a plan until they get punched in the face. In other words, you can have the best of intentions. You come up with an idea. You think it's wonderful. You've got these projections, these hockey stick projections that you're going to sell millions of them. And uh, it's only when you actually put it in front of a customer that you actually realize what's wrong with it, what you need to change, what will actually work in the real world, um, and uh, what you need to, to, how you need to actually alter the original invention that you came up with. IP is usually used in the context of protecting your idea, but I think it could be equally uh, well used in order to test market demand. How could you use IP in order to test your product out in the market? Yeah, that, that's really a great question. When I was talking about how to write intellectual property to overcome arguments, that's that punch in the face. That's coming. It's going to come. I can guarantee it. But if you're thinking ahead this way, you're ready for the punch. You're going to dodge it, right? You can move around. The punch happened to me when I was in federal court against Lego. I saw the punch coming, right? But I knew enough about stealing it from myself that I was thinking, out thinking the design, out thinking engineers ahead of me. So when the punch came, I was ready for the punch. Now, here's another thing I'm going to talk a lot about this afternoon, the most important thing you can do is create market demand. And when you combine market demand with IP, it's that winning formula that works. Now, what do we mean by market demand? I'll give you an example. I am involved in a project called Fishbone. You go to fishbone.com, please do that. You'll be amazed that you see, you'll see this innovation. This innovation was created by two inventors they brought me on to, to help with the intellectual property and the licensing part of it. And we just had a concept. In fact, you can see it up there. It's on a product called Brita, Brita Filters, Brita Water. That's one of our first uh, launches. They just had a concept. They didn't have any issued IP. And now they're going to reach out in the packaging industry and work with the biggest players in the world. You're talking Cokes and Pepsis and the big guys, Anheuser Busch, all the big guys. Now, how do three guys play the biggest game in the world with a company like that? All right, so this is the strategy, and I'll give you a, a little brief picture of this, going to go very deep into strategy. And you can use this strategy with everything that you do when it comes to IP to test the market. We showed it to a few companies. We were a little early, timing's everything, we couldn't get any interest. But eventually one of the big companies called, one of the big beverage companies liked it. So we went out there. And of course we didn't know what we were doing to tell you the truth. We were a little, little young, you know, we were kind of falling over ourselves a little bit. And because that, their world is very different because of uh, supply chain issues and manufacturing issues and scalability issues. It's just the biggest thing on the planet, right? To, to license to those type of companies but they wanted it. They called us, they called a meeting. They saw demand. They said, look, if you can deliver it, we want it. That's all I needed now. That was market demand. And they told me what they wanted. You know, it's really amazing. The speaker this morning, Kimberly said something that was so amazing to me. She said, be curious, ask questions. People will give you the roadmap. And, and that company did, they gave us a roadmap. They said, look, you need to find a supply chain person that we already currently work with. Wow, market demand, they, I need a supply chain person. So we found that supply chain person, brought them to the table. Now the company said, all right, you've got the right guy. They said, we'll build the machines, we'll sell the fish bones, we'll service it, we'll do everything. And we landed our licensing deal with the pr largest privately held package company in the United States with the concept with filing a, a, a PPA, a provisional patent application, and with market demand. Now, you have to realize we have filed a lot of IP on that because now we're playing 
and not only uh, uh, the U.S., but around the world with that. And you'll see that rolled out to other companies. So getting back to your question, I, I know I went long with this because this is so important. If you walk away from this talk with anything, realize the market demand is the best tool for you to go forward. If I have just a little kernel of idea and I can get a retailer to say, I want it, or companies say, well, I want it. And that's what Kimberly was talking about. That's what she was doing too. She was creating that market demand. That's enough to get people to, to invest, to license it, to do all those things. And it's such a great tool and people don't realize it's available to all of us. Sure, I like that. I've never thought of market demand as a, as an RP asset before, but uh, absolutely. Yes. Um, so we've, we've rapidly run out of time. I can't believe how quickly it's gone. Um, so I'm going to have to wrap up here, uh, right. but I'm going to invite some questions from the audience. Uh, yes. What, his, his view on patents, is that what you're referring to? Well, he's a very good marketer. You know, someone said to me the other day about um, your brand, and they compared a brand of a company's how many views with the, the CEO, and they realized the CEO had more views than the brand that the corporation did. So he's very good at that. I think you need to be very careful in social media today, right? Everybody's watching, everybody's listening. I also think it's important, sometimes it's not what you say. So sometimes, um, I think it's important. I think sometimes um, he, he talks quite a bit, which is kind of makes me nervous. And I'm not, I don't even own the stock. It makes me nervous. He talks so much about it. But uh, he's a very unique individual in changing the world. Yeah. Any other questions? Just one quick question from our side. I mean, you, you obviously have a, a US experience. We're sitting here at the tip of Africa, uh, can be quite intimidating okay. to approach US companies, for example, are they going to take us seriously? Um, is that a, a valid concern to have or, or should South Africans be approaching US companies without? Um, yeah, that's a great question because like I said, we have students, we've had students in over 65 different countries and I'll give you a good example. There's a, a gentleman in Cairo that uh, watched my videos and he watched the the 10 steps and he went to our website. We have a lot of free resources and read my book, One Simple Idea. And now his product has been licensed and sells around the world. And he's also kept some of the manufacturing for himself that he manufactures in Egypt. But now to see his product around the world, because he watched a YouTube, he watched, he read a book and he, he understood the product licensing piece. So yes, what I'm going to share with you this afternoon is how to break the barriers down. My goal is to say, look, there's no barriers. People need ideas no matter where you live. It, the world has changed. It's such a small place now. So, yes, you can play the biggest game in the world sitting at your desk at home in South Africa. Fantastic. And uh, that's a great note to end it all. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen, for some real nuggets of wisdom. Uh, we covered a lot in half an hour. We could have sat for another two hours, I think. But uh, we do have the, the treat of you for another three and a half hours uh, after lunch. So again, I encourage everyone to, uh, to change your plans and uh, come back and listen to Stephen a bit later. So uh, thank you very much. It was real, a real treat for me. No, thank you. Another round of applause, please, for Dr. Gavin Simonovitz and Stephen Key. Thanks very much, gentlemen. That was insightful. It was good, and it was just enough meat for the 30 minutes. I took away my own take-home points, as I usually do, um, and you said three important things that I think are worth repeating. Um, Stephen said that we mustn't let fear stop us. I think that's important. I think all of us encounter fear one form or, or another when we're embarking on something new or perhaps dealing with people that we think, you know, we're not worthy of dealing with. And I think Kim alluded to that as well earlier. And I liked the way, the context in which he said it. He said, companies need your idea. So to see our ideas as assets, 
um, and not kind of be cagey about it and end, up, and end up stealing those ideas from ourselves. He also mentioned something that I quite liked where he said we must view IP from a business perspective so that it, the IP lines up with the business objectives. So sometimes you find that you've got an idea, run off with the IP, but the business is not growing at the same rate as you know the sort of IP steps you're putting in place. So I like that very much as an IP lawyer. Um, it's something that we always have, advise our clients. You know, you want your business to grow alongside your IP. Um, and I, I especially like this part: take away the risk so people can join your mission. Um, it's such an important thing. Um, you know, people want to work with people who are winning and who are doing what they can to minimize risk. So that was very good. Thank you so much.